Hey scholars, it's good to be back with you and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a really cool idea called specific impulse. Now specific impulse sounds more than a little nerdy and I suppose it is, but it's very valuable. It's a really powerful way to connect the operation of uh, jets and rockets in a really, really simple expression. If you can multiply, you can work with specific impulse. Before we get started, we've got to uh, get something out of the way here. Specific impulse is not the Star Trek kind of impulse, where nobody's saying impulse power Mr. Sulu and off we go to the stars. It's not that kind of impulse. Impulse is just change in momentum. And momentum is just m dot v, mass times velocity. Okay, so if you apply a force to an object and it starts moving and it changes speed, going faster or slower, its momentum changes. Its mass may have changed or it may not, but velocity definitely changed. So impulse is just change in momentum. That's all it is. Now what's specific impulse? Well, that's a little more subtle. So to change your momentum within a jet or a rocket, you have to burn fuel, right? So specific impulse is the change in momentum per unit fuel burn per second. So it's basically change in impulse over fuel flow rate. That's what that specific thing means. Specific means per unit fuel burned or, or flow rate. So let's write this down. And remember, yes, it's an equation, but all you got to be able to do is multiply here. So the thrust, and this is a force. So we're, we're going to do this in metric units. Um, we're not going to do this in English units. No hogs heads per cubic furlong or something. Um, so force and thrust is going to be in newtons equals g0, which is just the acceleration of gravity in meters per second squared, ISP, specific impulse, and the next thing you need is m dot. So that's gravity, that's your specific impulse, and that's your fuel flow rate. That's what that dot means. That's in kilograms per second. So that's 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, that's specific impulse. This is going to be in kilograms per second, and this will be in newtons. Now, to make this work out, specific impulse is going to be, see, mass times velocity divided by, uh, let's see, mass flow rate. And when you get, when you multiply through everything here, the units turn out to be in seconds. Well, specific impulse isn't a time. But it is, it is a, a, a change in momentum divided by mass flow. So if you divide all the units out, it really does come out in seconds. Well, what do we do with that? Where does this come from? You can measure it, I suppose. Let me rearrange this equation just a little bit. All I'm going to do is divide through by G0 and M. So we're, we're all the way up to probably junior high school algebra right now. Okay, that's how this works. So it's the thrust you get divided by your, your flow rate in weight instead of mass. That's all that is. And this comes out in seconds as the units. Well, I need some numbers here. I don't have any sense of, of context for this. We're going to get away from the board here in a second. We'll go to my screen and I'll show you some examples. But if you want a range, rockets are in the neighborhood of a few hundred. Um, the, the most efficient rocket, liquid fuel rocket I know of, is one that burns liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And you get a, a specific impulse in the neighborhood of 300 or 350 seconds. So what does that mean? Well, rockets burn an awful lot of fuel, but they make an awful lot of thrust, so it's kind of hard to tell how efficient they are. Let's try something else. A turbofan, like on an airliner with that those great big cowling on the front, and it's burning jet fuel and it's using the air from uh, the oxygen from the air so it doesn't have to carry all that fuel that oxidizer with it um, that has a specific impulse in the thousands of seconds all right so those are pretty much your range here so uh, let's let's go to some pictures and some maybe some examples okay we'll go to my computer right now all right here's a really nifty plot i found on wikipedia this is the wikipedia article on specific impulse if you want to go check it out yourself across the horizontal axis is mach number and on the vertical axis is specific impulse 
If you're looking at rockets, we're in this red band here. The specific impulse doesn't really change with Mach number when you're uh, working with rockets because they don't really interact with the air around them. Uh, they carry the fuel and oxidizer on board. And right here is SSME on Space Shuttle. SSME means Space Shuttle Main Engine. That's a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engine. And in a vacuum, it has a specific impulse of about 450 seconds. At sea level, it's more like, I don't know, 360, something like that. And that's because if you're pushing into an, uh, the atmosphere, you know, you're pushing against something. When you're pushing into a vacuum, you're not. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the, the basic idea. Now let's start moving up this, this scale here. Now notice this is the theoretical maximum. HC means hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon is anything, any fuel that uses hydrogen and carbon to make a ring or a fuel. So uh, kerosene is a hydrocarbon, gasoline is a hydrocarbon, diesel fuel is a hydrocarbon. You get the idea. So the fastest engines right now are called scramjets. That's supersonic combustion ramjet. These are all air-breathing engines, and uh, they bring the fuel with them, but the, the oxygen comes from the outside air. So ramjet runs slower than a scramjet, but still quite fast. We're the Mach 4, Mach 5 is kind of the hypersonic range now. And right there, see it says P&W J58. That's the J58 engine that goes on the SR-71. And it's a very unusual engine uh, designed to function at high speed for long periods of time. This plane is designed to cruise at around Mach 3. Nobody will actually say, but it's a little higher than Mach 3 or the numbers you see a lot. And its specific impulse is almost 2,000 seconds. So it's relatively efficient compared to a rocket. Now, even with that, the SR-71 is a, basically a flying fuel tank. One of the other rare air breathing engines, jet engines, that's designed to run at high speeds for a very long time is the Rolls-Royce Olympus that they used on the Concorde a long time ago. Concorde has been out of service for quite a while. It's an after-burning turbofan. It's designed to cruise at about Mach 2.2 with a specific impulse significantly higher than the SR-71, about 3,000. So we get up to here, you're, you're talking about engines that may be it's almost 10 times, 8 times as efficient as any chemical rocket engine. Well, if you're willing to live with subsonic and you want to go to a turbofan, GECF6 is the turbofan that was on the Boeing 747, and it has a specific impulse of 6,000, which is really high. You know, now we're in the range of being, you know, 15 times higher than a rocket engine. Much, much, much more efficient. The other thing to note is that CF6 is not a new engine. There are newer engines. So if you want to go out and look up some of the more recent high bypass turbofans, it's possible that you'll find specific impulses of more than 6,000. So let's see if we can find some actual values for these types of engines. Okay, so here we are back at this uh, Wikipedia article. I'm a little farther down in it now, and here's a table showing specific impulses for different kinds of engines. The two rocket engines up here are both chemical rockets. This NK-33, see a picture of it right there, is a liquid oxygen RP-1 engine. Now this is akin to the uh, Rocketdyne F-1 that was on the Saturn V first stage. LOX is liquid oxygen, it's exactly what you think it is. And uh, RP-1 is basically just jacked up kerosene. It's a very refined kerosene. The other thing to notice here is the scenario. It says vacuum. Well, if rocket exhaust has to push into air, it's actually there's some resistance there. So you get a slightly different answer than if you're pushing into a vacuum. The specific impulse of this LOX RP1 engine is 331 seconds. And that's, that's pretty good for that fuel oxidizer combination. As far as I know, pretty much the limit for chemical rockets is liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, which is uh, used in a lot of engines, including the Space Shuttle main engine. It's got a specific impulse of 453 when it's pushing into a vacuum. Numbers start getting really big over here when we start looking at air burning. So there's a ramjet, there's the J58 turbojet off the SR-71, and all the way down here to the General Electric CF6 turbo efficient. The last column over here really only makes sense for rockets. 
um, it, the ex effective exhaust velocity is calculated from an equation and it assumes that the exhaust velocity is due to onboard propellants only. Well, when you're starting to burn air, there's no, you know, air is from the outside. It's not carried along with the, the vehicle. So these numbers, just for reference here, orbital velocity is about 7,700 meters a second. It's obvious that the, the, uh, effect, the actual exhaust velocity of a turbofan is not 115,000 meters per second. That's way faster than orbital velocity. In fact, that's faster than escape velocity from the Earth. So that these numbers, once you get past that 4,440, 4, really don't make physical sense here. This second table here talks more about the propulsion technology. So there's for a turbofan engine, which we've talked about. So here you can see the two solid rocket boosters that will be eventually fixed to a space shuttle. Um, this is on the carrier, the Caterpillar, that carries the completed vehicle out to the launch pad. So this is really big. I can see a truck, right? And here we are for the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engines at about 450. And that really is the limit for chemical rockets. Well, there are more than chemical rockets. How about ion thrusters with an effective velocity, exhaust velocity of 29,000 meters per second? Specific impulse of 3,000. That means an ion thruster has about the same efficiency as a turbofan. The big problem with ion thrusters is that the thrust they make is very, very small. Nowhere near enough to launch a rocket off the ground. They get used, when they're used at all, to uh, modify orbits or sometimes they can, they've been proposed that they could run for days or weeks at a time to, to uh, boost a vehicle that's already in orbit. Now, Vasimir, I had to actually look up, and it's a magnetoplasma rocket. Well, the specific impulse is nice and high, but uh, unclear that these are practical. Now, there's a dual-stage four-grid electrostatic ion thruster. This just screams uh, experimental. I don't know of any of these being used. And the ideal photonic rocket, well, photons, little particles of light, do have momentum. Exhaust velocity, there it is, at the speed of light. And if you could get this to work, we can't yet, but if you could get it to work, the specific impulse is spectacular. So there's, there's plenty of room at the top if we can figure out how to make these technologies work. So before we leave, let's do a couple of quick calculations. Okay, so here we are on my uh, computer and we're using a program called MathCAD. Uh, MathCAD is one of my favorite ways to uh, do calculations. It's probably the easiest way I know of to beat numbers out of a computer. And uh, the only thing wrong with it is the name MathCAD isn't very good. It doesn't have anything to do with CAD. It's a number crunching program. So here's what it looks like. Let's, let's just uh, basically spec out a rocket here. For initial uh, info, let's say that the uh, uh, thrust from the engine is 100,000 newtons, and if you want that in uh, pounds force, it's about 22,500 pounds force, pretty much. Um, specific impulse is 275, so this is not a very big rocket, so that's about right for a small uh, solid fuel engine. Let's, let's put the mass of the rocket in here. Well, how big should it be? About 10,000 kilograms. And we'll make these numbers up and do some calculations on what uh, what the performance of the rocket would be. And I think we're going to find out that this is going to be a bit of a challenge to get every, you know, find a, a place in design space where all this is going to work. So fuel consumption. How do you figure out fuel consumption? Let's m dot dot m dot is force uh, provided by the engine divided by the specific impulse times the acceleration of gravity, just like we saw on my board a few minutes ago. So 37.068 kilograms per second. Wow. So that's like 80 pounds of fuel per second. So 1,001. There just went 80 pounds of fuel. That's that's the, the flow rate we're talking about here. So that's really big. All right. So if we want this in uh, newtons per second, let's just do this. There it is, and that looks like a crazy unit, but that's in newtons per second. Oops. And if you want it in pound force per second, MathCAD can do the calculation for us. So there it is in pounds force per second as well. So, you know, 81, 82 pounds per second of fuel. All right, so let's talk about masses now. 
if the, the rocket weighs, has a mass of 10,000 kilograms, the weight of the rocket is just the mass of the rocket times G0, and that's uh, 98,100 newtons. So again, let's do the weight in pounds just for those of us who want to think about it that way. Pounds force is what that LBF means. So it's 22,000 pounds. So big, but not crazy big. This is along the lines of a sounding rocket. Let's, let's actually call this something else. Acceleration. There we go. Um, let's try something here. We need to know how, what percentage of the uh, mass of the rocket is fuel. Well, it better be a lot. So let's say the, the percentage is 0 0.80. That's, that's, how, that's how much fuel, or what, what percentage of the weight of the rocket is in fuel. So the mass of the fuel is going to be N times mass of the rocket. I better come out to, uh, let's see, 8,000 kilograms, right? There it is. So we've got 8,000 kilograms, basically 8 tons of fuel in this rocket, and it's going away at 37 kilograms per second. Well, how long is this, this engine going to run at, you know, that, given what we've got here? So it, T will be the time that the engine runs. Mass of the fuel divided by M dot. Dit dot. There we go. Okay, this will run, this engine will run for, uh, Let's see, 215, almost 216 seconds. Well, is that enough? Let's try this. The initial acceleration of the rocket is going to be the force made by the engine divided by the mass of the rocket. Oh, except now we have to uh, subtract out the acceleration of gravity. 0.19 meters per second squared. That's nothing. That's not enough. That means the rocket will just barely come off the launch pad. Well, what would it, what would the acceleration be right about the time the engine runs out of fuel? So uh, that's going to be when 80% of the mass is gone because we've burned 80% of the mass in, as fuel. So let's do this. So we're going to calculate this as the force divided. Now instead of the mass of the rocket, it's going to be the mass of the rocket minus the mass of the fuel. Well, 50 meters a second. Well, meter uh, 9.81 meters per second is 1 g. Oh, but I didn't I didn't subtract out g zero. Darn, 40.2 meters a second. Well, that's about 4 g. So that's not too bad. Is that going to get us into orbit? Probably not, especially if that's our launch uh, acceleration. Now, if you want a uh, comparison, go look on YouTube and find a video of the Saturn V launching. Its initial acceleration is very, very slow. It seems to take just forever to get off the pad. In fact, I read somewhere that it burns something like 4% of its total onboard fuel just getting to the top of the launch gantry. So one of the reasons rockets are so big is you have to launch so much fuel to get them to work. Well, let's say we're going to try to change this. What do we do? Well, could we make a more efficient engine? What if you went from a solid fuel to a liquid fuel engine? Well, that'd be a big bump in ISP. All right, so your, your flow rate, uh, let's see, flow rate goes down for the given amount of thrust. Time that uh, the rocket will burn goes up a little bit, a fair bit. Um, the problem is that didn't change the initial acceleration unless it changes the thrust. So let's do that. All right, so 150,000 newtons. Okay, can we do that? You know, how far do you want to push that engine? How close to blowing up do you want it to get? That only gets you about half a G, a little more coming off the pad. Well, how skimpy can you make that structure? Because remember, you're not trying to launch fuel, you're trying to launch a payload. Well, let's say we can bump that up just a little, get ourselves back to 200 seconds almost. But pulling 9 Gs when the when the uh, rocket finally, the fuel finally burns out. All right. 
we don't need to go too far down this uh, path, but you get the idea that these are the engineering constraints that uh, rocket designers have to deal with. And this is what pushes rockets to get bigger and bigger and bigger. One way you can effectively change that number is with staging. Rockets often have multiple stages and they throw away the stages that they don't need anymore. So the, the, the structure gets lighter and lighter and lighter as you go up into the towards orbit. The problem is those stages you're throwing away are really expensive. Um, when you throw a used up stage into the ocean, that's a lot of money that just went into the water. The most interesting recent solution to that is the SpaceX Falcon 9 where they're flying the boosters back and reusing them. And it's working quite well. So let's stop here. We started by talking about uh, specific impulse connected it to rockets and to jet engines. Looked at some uh, representative numbers and then finally calculated some results of our own. So I hope this helps and we'll talk to you next time.